Welcome to Red Deer Public Library's Travel Memories Program for the first Wednesday in October. My name is Priscilla and um, I'm a staff here at Red Deer Public Library. I now have the pleasure of introducing Brenda and Jerry, today's presenters, and they're very well traveled. And if you're members of our audience, you've been enjoying the virtual edition of Travel Memories, you'll recognize their faces because they already have done two in-depth and very interesting presentations on India last winter. And we're sure glad to have them back again. Um, and before we went virtual, they also in June of 2019 did a really nice program on Sri Lanka too. So. This time we uh, will get to hear about Australia. So welcome back to Travel Memories. Well, thank you very much for having us back again. Um, we, we love to share our experiences. And this was our second trip to Australia. The first one we did kind of what I would call the normal tour with, um, with Sydney and Brisbane and, and Melbourne. So we went back a second time to do all the things that we missed the first time. And one of them was this amazing island called Kangaroo Island, which, which is off the south coast, coast, fairly close to Adelaide. I'll show you on that later. So we, uh oh, just a moment. There we go. So the drive, um, we started off early morning from Adelaide. It was, uh, it was really scenic. And what was fun was, there was so early in the morning, there were lots and lots of kangaroos, but Pretty difficult to photograph outside of a bus window. The rolling agricultural countryside was a beautiful change from some of the dry, flat inland we'd seen. They had large shelter belts of trees that helped divide up the crops and the fields. And it was interesting that every single farmer has to have a dugout to store the water because for the drier months, there's, there's nothing. And this was, and it's hard to see in this picture, but this was our first view of Kangaroo Island. Where we departed from was Cape Jervis. And what an interesting lighthouse. I love all the different lighthouses. And it's here that we catch a public ferry. And I absolutely love this motto of Kangaroo Island. Of course, above is the shape of the island. And here's an idea of what we're going to visit if you look at in the bottom right hand corner, you can see where the island actually is in relation to all the other, um, the other part of Australia. We arrive at a place called Penishaw, but we actually don't stay there at all. We toured for the entire afternoon and we end up at Kings County for the night and that's the two red dots on the map. Now, as you can see here, we were only there for two full days. I mean, obviously we had a couple of half days in there, but you can see by the yellow line that we were able to cover a very good part of the island. It's quite a small population of locals. And our guide said that you can find your own personal section of the beach without any trouble at all and no other people in sight. Now the island is mostly based on agricultural enterprises obviously as well as tourism. The trees were beautiful. They're tree lined and they were very, very well maintained. There's 1300 kilometers of them for you to explore. Not all of them were paved, some of them were a little rustic. This is covered with limestone. Our first stop was a honey farm and we learned a lot as well as tasted a few products and Jerry's favorite was the honey ice cream. Now this is the only place left on earth that has a pure strain of Ligurian bees. There are no other bees that can be imported to the island to keep them pure. They have, as you can see there, 3,000 hives, 200 tons of honey a year. And then seeing how they um, separate the wax and the honey was something we've never seen before. And of course the wax itself is a big seller. And it was kind of fun seeing a glassed in hive so you can stand as close as you want to this glass. And do you know that pure honey doesn't have an expiration date at all? It lasts forever. Here, they harvest the honey every three weeks, but the hives themselves actually have to be moved every six to eight weeks. 
And you can see here the size of the queen. And most of the beekeepers will replace the queen every couple of years. Now, this is just some interesting bee facts. And there's a couple of things that I like. One of them is that all the bees are the offspring of the queen. And the other one is she's fed royal jelly. I thought that was quite interesting. And she will lay one million eggs in her lifetime. As we drive to our next stop, a heat guana crosses the road. And luckily, the driver saw it in plenty of time to stop. At the Boney Bay, we get a chance to see some of the local vegetation. This is a grass tree, and it is very, very slow growing, but it's also very useful for the early Australians. This is a type of tea tree, which most of you will know produces a very, very nice oil, tea tree oil, and um, beautiful, beautiful blooms on it. It was full of blooms. This isn't a great picture, but it's such a beautiful little wren and we had to include it. Just look at that color. Our next stop was Sea Vale, this one, sorry, Seal Bay Conservation Park. And because they're protected here, you have to have a ranger accompany us all the way down to the beach to see the Australian sea lions. It was an absolutely exquisite setting. And there were quite a number of very lazy sea lions for us to see and to photograph. Now, because a bull can reach 350 kilograms, you don't get too close to any of them. And the ranger sure let us know if he felt we were getting too close. Lots of the little ones, the younger ones, were sparring and talking and shouting at each other. And the younger pups would be in small groups. We loved seeing some of the pups that were nursing and thought that was that was quite interesting. The mother looks totally, totally relaxed. They'll nurse for up to a year and a half. There were a few in the water as well, coming ashore and some heading out as well. And some were just chilling and scratching. It was a very, very nice stop. You can see how many are on the beach behind us. And just a different point of view to show how well organized and how well preserved the area is. So from sea, sorry, from sea lions to birds, this was also a fascinating stop to see some of the bird life of Australia. The park is run by Dave Irwin, who is a cousin of the famous crocodile hunter, Steve Irwin, who, as you know, is deceased, and they put on a great show. This guy's called a tawny frogmouth. Certainly nothing we'd ever seen. A familiar one, the kestrel, and this barn owl, he was inside the hole until one of the trainers called it and it popped out. They are exquisite birds and I was amazed that they could have up to seven chicks in the season. And then he went hopping along and checked all the audience out. For a treat, he was given a whole mouse. Now, please take a look at this picture. Can you see the tongue of the mouse? outside the story, the tail of the mouse <laughs> coming outside of the bird's beak. They'll eat up to six mice a night. The reason I'm including this one is black breasted vulture has a fascinating way of eating. First you have to find an egg, then you find a rock you can carry. You carry the rock to the egg, you drop the rock on the egg, and then you enjoy your lunch. This is a sooty owl, and to me, he looks very out of proportion. Such a big head and such a short, small body. And I got a chance to have a closer look. He's pretty cute, actually. Now, the kookaburras, of course, are a highlight because so many of us know them from the song. There are a number of species, but these are the laughing kookaburras. Jerry got a chance to hold one and give you an idea of how big they are. They're quite a big, heavy bird. Bigger still are the predators. This is a wedge-tailed eagle, and you can see that his wingspan can be up to 2.7 meters long, and they can live quite a length of time. They're actually strong enough to take down a kangaroo because they've got a really big claw on its talon. I also enjoyed the reptiles on display and held this 
beautiful python. But it got a little squirmy and started wrapping itself around me and I needed to have some help getting him off of me. Back on the roads again. Now the weather is between, you know, 23, 24 degrees. So very, very nice weather when we were there. And the back roads really are beautiful. Most of these are eucalyptus or the gum trees. And you can see where Jerry's standing there, how big the trees do get. And then the closer we get to, to Kings Cote, we see some hillside vineyards. And the shield trees are quite unusual. Australia has absolutely magnificent seed pods on its plants. They've been used for rattles, for oil pots, for decorations. Um, they're just, they really are unusual. Now, right outside the city, as we're heading into Kins Cody, we follow this big fellow for a way, so we're just going parallel with him. These guys have a wingspan of between 2.3 and 2.6 meters. Just to put it in perspective, that's like up to eight and a half feet. And here's the destination. It's time to feed the pelicans. So in this area is where people used to gather to watch the little penguins come ashore at night. But there's numbers are so discreet, so decreased, and there's so few left that the, um, the tourists are not allowed to see them anymore. So the pelican man seems to have taken over. First he fed the pesky seagulls to get them out of the way, and obviously you can tell that's been done before. This is a beautiful Pacific gull, and look at that colorful bill. But the larger Australian white pelicans are starting to get restless. So it's time to hand out buckets of fish. Oh, and they're noisy. Now, being close to these big birds, I'm sitting right in the very front row is a little bit unnerving. But I didn't have any fish, so it didn't attract any attention. Because these guys can weigh between 9 and 28 pounds, you know, 4 to 13 kilograms. And let me tell you, they are ready to eat. Look at this one. He's so excited that he grabs the entire pelican man's hand. This one tries from the top, but doesn't get anything. And I would say that this was the winner today and got a full feed. And you just tilt up that jaw and you can see it going down his throat. Now, at a certain point, the rest of the fish goes into the water and there's a mad scramble. But they all seem pretty content. And they also know that he's coming again the next day. Now, these pelicans are absolutely beautiful. Um, the largest ones we've seen, and by far the um, very colorful ones, they're the largest bill of any living bird with the record size of 50 centimeters long. They're striking color. And big eyes make them really, really fun to photograph. And this pink bill looks pretty neat with the sun shining through it. This one's quite old, and you can tell that by the color and the textures that are in his bill. But look at those eyes. Way too many pictures, but we never, ever tire of photographing pelicans. And the opportunity to get this close was a great, great memory. Now, there were lots of other birds around as well. Um, please know that. This is called a masked lapwing. And then the day was over for as far as touring. So we wandered around the town of about 1600. It is the capital of the island. And a grain elevator is um, certainly a large part of the industry here. But it's fascinating that the grain is collected, then it's trucked to the ferries, and it's taken across to the mainland. So it's very, very expensive to move the crops and the produce around here. The history dates back to 1836, and there's various plaques and monuments and historical sites around town. And what was interesting here is when they landed, they had a discussion about uh, who was gonna be the first person off, and they decided that a, a baby, a little girl, two-year-old, should be the first one off. And, and that's what these plaques are all about. The signs and the humor of the Australians is always, always present. And we just love photograph them. In the bottom, right there, we see me and her out back was on a camper. Our hotel was right on the ocean. Very simple, but very, very nice accommodations. In the insert, you see a couple of different houses. 
And you see me having a fish sandwich for supper. Look at the size of that sandwich. Now the next day we venture out again. These are grass trees, which I mentioned earlier. The big flowers, the tall stalks, they're so hard that they were actually used as spears by the Aborigines. We stopped at a eucalyptus oil distillery. Now there's only certain plants they can use, and this one is the narrow leaf mallee. And when we even picked the little leaf and crushed it, the smell was exquisite. There used to be 48 distilleries on the island, but sheep proved to be more economical, so these started going out of business. Now there's only three in all of Australia. This farm has 100,000 trees to harvest, and a good crop would be 36,000 liters. Now, in case you didn't know, the oil can be used for disinfectant, insect repellent, um, decongestant, stain remover, um, it removes tar, it can even be used on cuts and abrasions. So a pretty all-purpose oil. This guy did not clean up any of his old machinery. He was what you call a gunna man. I'm gonna do it sometime. We enjoyed seeing all the old machinery. And of course, being named Emu Ridge Distillery, there was a resident emu. Psycho was her name, and she was left to herself because she was very aggressive. She had already killed her mate. These are powerful birds. Look at those feet. And thank goodness for telephone lenses so we didn't have to get any closer. And a small mob of kangaroo, um, kangaroos put in the appearance as well. They're smaller than the kangaroos on the mainland and have a little bit of a darker fur to them. But they are just as cute. So after the oil distillery, we headed to Pandana Wildlife Park to allow us to see more of what the local wildlife is. Now, Cape Barren geese were actually quite common on our trip. We saw them in a number of um, different areas. Beautiful colored parrots. We didn't see many of those around. The little tamar wallabies, quite a bit smaller than a kangaroo, and we did see some of those in the wild. And this is not a laughing kookaburra, it's a blue-winged kookaburra. And this huge boar was quite an unusual sight as it appears we turned the corner, and there are quite a large number of wild boar on the island. And then we got to visit with koalas again, and they're such a treat. They were actually introduced to the island in 1823, and they were so successful that they now have to be controlled to actually protect the trees. So they started at 18 and grew to amazing, like, like 50,000 of them. How these guys can be comfortable in these positions, and they sleep up to 18 hours a day, so just think of hanging yourself over a log and having a rest. They're very territorial, and in each of their territories, they have a favorite eucalyptus tree. When they are awake, they communicate with grunts and growls, and very, very interesting sound, actually. And they can be heard from a kilometer away. Now, babies are born at 35 days. This guy's obviously getting quite old, but they're born at 35 days. And when they're born, they're just the size of a cashew nut. Look at these little guys, they are so cute. We also enjoyed the friendly kangaroos and you can see that I'm scratching the chest of one of them there. They're very exquisite. Now I'm gonna get Jerry to do a little bit of work here. They're very pretty inquisitive if you think you have food there. Jerry will just go back and forth a couple times. <laughs> I could have actually animated it, but it's just as much fun that way. Um, and they'll actually hold on to your hand while they see. They're just impressive animals and lots and lots of fun. It's actually amazing the variety of sizes and colors that we saw. And in other parts of Australia, we have different pictures with, zo with joeys and things. The galas, a very, very common Australia bird. They're, uh, they're common and they're very, very noisy. Some young eagles were roosting there. And for us, it might be funny for you guys, but we were thrilled to finally meet the elusive echidna. 
Seriously, many Australians have never seen the face of one. These are egg-laying mammals called monotremes, like a platypus. Um, they hatch at the size of a jelly bean, hairless and blind, and they spend six weeks in the pouch. And then when they start to grow their spines, they stay behind in a burrow. They're nocturnal, and they do curl up in a defensive ball, which is why lots of Australians never see the face. Look at those claws, they're just amazing. No teeth, but they have a 15 centimeter tongue. And, uh, oh, and then this, speaking of tongues, this is a blue-tongued skink. And I'm sorry, I know it's not a sharp picture, is it? And a brush turkey. And cassowaries, my gosh, they look so ancient. They do look like dinosaurs, and, and they're very aggressive. They can be, if you look at those feet, you don't want to meet one of these in the woods. Thank you. Now, this display was really touching. You read about how small marsupials are at birth. But this really does show it. So um, left and above, like that's a kangaroo at two to three weeks, so he's already crawled into his mother's pouch. Now, kangaroos are very plentiful all over Australia. Many, many are killed every year. So it's not like these would have been killed to, to get these samples. To top off our visit there, this baby tamar wallaby needed some cuddling. He was an orphan. So Jerry and I just step right up to volunteer. And we fed him the last of his bottle. So the flowers, the seed pods, and the plants are all part of Australia's, of Australia's draw. And talk about excited. Here we are. We actually finally got to see an echidna right in front of us. We got these pictures out of a, of a moving bus. So that's pretty impressive. And our next stop is Finders Chase National Park. The word chase means wide open spaces. It's one of Australia's earliest and largest conversation, conservation parks. Some of the vistas were outstanding. A third of the entire island has never been cleared of natural vegetation. And this is part of it here. Now, a wildfire did go through a year ago, and you can see some of the the dead branches. I missed one, Jerry. Sorry, we're one ahead. Um, anyway, this is one of my favorite, favorite road pictures, and I was looking on the computer, and you should see what it looked like after the fire last year. We reached the coastline, and in the distance, you can see our destination called Remarkable Rocks. They're a cluster of granite boulders that sit on top of a dome, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Weird and wonderful shapes have been created by erosion, and we enjoyed this visit so much. It was really fun trying to capture the perfect, the perfect picture to show this natural sight. Trust my husband to keep saying, isn't this remarkable? Isn't this remarkable? And the orange lichen just added to a scene almost like a painting. They felt like alien rocks from another world. And we just kept snapping pictures. This one looks to me like a mother bird bending down to grab its egg. This should give you a good perspective of the size of some of these things. Weird and wonderful, wonderful shapes. Use your imagination. This is my pig face here. The area is, is very isolated and surrounded by green shrubs. Definitely a highlight of the island. Now close by is Cape de Kuadik Lighthouse built in 1907. There's some very, very rugged coastline here. There's been lots of shipwrecks in this area. We're here to see Admiral Arch. It was very artistic with the stalactites hanging down in the rock, the walkway led you right to the bottom. But going any further was, it was pretty slippery because the waves in high tide do come up fairly high. And from further away, you can see where we actually were. This is home again to some of the Australian fur seals. 
And if you look carefully, how many can you pick out on here? Well, it, well, I don't think that'll I'll get Jerry to do. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten for sure. And um, so that was kind of fun. Now this is quite interesting. Um, it's a very barren landscape again. And early lighthouse keepers kind of suffered from from isolation. And to get their supplies up to their lighthouse, they actually had to have a cable running from the shoreline right up from the ships below. And there were a couple of areas where you could actually see the cables and, and some of the, um, the building ruins that had been there. So that was part of the story of this area is how tough life on the, on the coastline was. Now on our way back to King's Cody, we stop at a sanctuary for wildlife and we try to find koalas in their own natural habitat. We counted up to about 20 and then gave up keeping track. They're really hard, hard to spot if you don't look far enough up. Now just take a look at these facts. So they sleep 18 to 20 hours a day. They wedge themselves into forks of trees. They only eat a certain number of the eucalypts. Um, they live for 20 years, but most of them only survive, you know, 13 to 15. And the Aboriginal word koala means no drink. Reflecting that the koalas get all the liquid they need from the leaves they eat. And if you look at the picture of me walking on the bottom, you can see how far up that koala is. Okay, they roll up in a ball of fur. They, they just don't even look real at times. You don't even realize it's an actual animal. Look how this one is draped over the branch. Isn't that amazing? Look at him. Now in the other picture, can you see the koala? Can you find it in the left? <laughs> because you can't answer, I will assume you did. Good eyesight is needed. Just take a look at how these things just sit up here. So you may go to Australia looking for koalas and if you don't know what to look for, you're not even gonna find them. We weren't, were, they weren't worried about us. That's for darn sure. Most of them just, just kept sleeping. They're very calm and docile, but if they do get riled up, they can be very aggressive, especially to other males who would come into their territory. Believe it or not, this is a mom and a baby. They were down very low, but they wouldn't wake up and we never did see a baby's face. They are so cute. They're very heavy and solid. When you think of lifting them up, you probably think of a teddy bear, but they're not. They're very, very heavy. As we were leaving, some kangaroos put in a wonderful appearance, as did some little wallabies along the road. And that kind of concluded the, the guided tour for our day. But we headed off and did some hiking along the coast beside the town. It also was extremely scenic, beautiful, beautiful countryside. And the following day, we ventured down to Reeves Point. It was quite a little hike, but lots of things to do and see. The colorful, the little Corollas, sorry, not colorful, the little Corollas were very easy to spot. But you hear these guys long before you ever see them. And this is a white ibis. This is a white ibis and a darter. Now the locals call this a razor fish, but that is not what we consider a razor clam. We would call this a pen shell. And the local fishermen told us great stories. Like we, it was fun, they were along the shore, so we stopped to talk to them. And, um, and they said that you could just take your lawn chair out, sit it down in the sand, and these guys sit point down in the sand, and you just pluck them out, pry them open, and eat the meat. And there were lots and lots of these shells along the shoreline. Look at the size of them. So I'm pretty sure it is an Australian pen shell because it looks like the quill, a quill pen. <laughs> the, um, the volcanic rock formation was fascinating. Absolutely beautiful designs, colors, and textures. The shells, very plentiful, very tiny but very exquisite. Now this is a cuttlefish bone. I knew about the cuttlefish from when I had a pet bird and we would put a, a cuttlefish like this in the cage and they would use it to sharpen their bill. So that was my first encounter with the cuttlefish. 
They're related to squid and octopus. Um, you, they can get up to be 23 pounds and they can live, you know, two years. They can change color and pattern for camouflage and they're eaten especially in Asia. And they're once used for a dye. Now, when we saw this shell, we just thought supper. Oh my goodness, what a size of a lobster. This is a rock lobster. Another masked lapwing. The beautiful ibis with his long curved bill. The pied cormorants. And even the magpies are better in Australia. They have very nice music. The beautiful galas again. Tiny flowers um, carpeted the ground and you can see the honey eater bird with these colorful feathers. And back to our hotel to catch a bus to the airport. Once again, we're um, on a small plane and a very small radio control tower. Look at the size of that thing. But it was fun that we arrived by sea and we leave by air because it was a very good chance to see the island below us. And what a wonderful view of the whole Kings Cody area. And this shows where Reeve Point was. You can see that very pointed finger out into the water. And it's back to the mainland and Adelaide to start yet another part of our adventure down under. So we're going to switch now. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it really is a wonderful place to visit. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go to a different part of the island. So we have to go here, Jerry. There we go. And we're going to head for Cooper Petey. Now, as I said before, on this part of our journey, we did all sorts of little things. So we had started in Perth, took the train across Australia to Adelaide, did Kangaroo Island, we did Coober PD, we did Tasmania, and then we took a cruise from Sydney. So we'd seen a lot of Australia. This was probably the weirdest part of Australia that we saw. It's a very short flight from Adelaide, and as you can see, that's very similar to the picture I finished with last time. It's Glenelg Beach, about 12 kilometers outside of Adelaide and full of resorts. The patchworks of farmland and industrial works was quite colorful. And we love the way the roads all gathered to the center of this town. But the further north we go, the land starts to change very dramatically. The land is full of salt pans and not productive at all. Although salt was and is still mined in Australia. The salt dunes, you can tell the wind has blown the salt across the land. Soon we realized we're in the middle of nowhere and we're still going. And then we start to pick up debris from opal mining. Every little bit of gravel indicates a miner's hole. Now it's hard to make out the holes and the shrubs, but it certainly represents the entire landscape we are going to visit very, very well. Most of the mines are operated by only one or two men, but there are some larger companies that use bigger equipment, as you can see in this picture here. This is our arrival. You can see there isn't much delay in getting out of the um, 30 passenger plane and getting our luggage. So the same people did all that. They took the luggage off, they put the new luggage back on, and then they waved off the plane. So we got to watch the plane take off in the heat waves and um, before we headed off on our tour. Now, Kudapiti can reach as high as 50 degrees. But the average temperature hovered between 25 and 30. It was 41 when we arrived. The heat keeps falling us. Note the number of rainy days. And so our hotel awaits. It has a pool and a bar and a restaurant and shops. A very, very nice facility. 
we chose an underground room to have this experience. The temperature remains at a very constant 23 to 25 degrees. However, if you're used to living in Alberta, that's still pretty warm. So we actually did have a fan on at night to cool ourselves off. We had a drink in the lounge along with a number of the locals who were enjoying the gambling machines that were there. Main Street isn't too busy. It's just, it's just too hot to be wandering around. Notice that the population is about 3,500 and represents 45 nationalities. So in our very short time there, we met a Bosnian, a Croatian, and lots of Aboriginals. Our tours are on an air-conditioned minibus, so we certainly didn't suffer. Um, just leave it there, Jerry. Wonderful views of this unique city. Now, please look at this picture and take a look at the, the pipes sticking out of the ground. Each one of those is some sort of ventilation from the building that is in the hill below it. These underground homes are called dugouts. And you can see that the meaning of the word um, Kupa Petty comes from Kupa Pitti, which means white man in a hole. I think that's very, very appropriate. Now, oh, I'm sorry, I mentioned that another one, that 60% of the town lives underground. Um, since 1915, the town has been supplying most of the world's gem quality locals, but today it relies very heavily on tourism as well. The town was established in 1915. And the museums are wonderful. They show what life was like for a miner in the early days. So this is totally underground. You can see the little kitchen area and off to the left is, is kind of the bedroom. Very, very primitive, but actually very, very comfortable. And again, at that constant, constant temperature. So they had everything they needed except of course for water rationing. So that bucket had to last at least two weeks. Um, now water is very, very plentiful coming from a pipeline that's over 24 kilometers away, but then they would haul water in. And I don't know if I can make it with that kind of watering. The, the constant temperatures and the darkness make it a really quiet place to retreat from the sun. The museum had kept the house decorated in the styles of the 1950s and 60s. And you can see by the inset, there was even a chandelier in the ceiling. There's the kitchen and down the hallway was a bathroom and a door to the outside. The bedroom was pretty sparsely furnished. I think there should be at least one picture on the wall. Now, one of these dugout homes, a standard three bedroom, say, can be built for very similar prices building a home on the surface. It's hard, very hard to tell with these what it would be like inside. This was known as one of the nicer homes in the area. Apparently behind this facade is a very, very modern home, um, very expensive mansion. It would have been very, very interesting to tour one of them. And here we've got an empty lot that is awaiting a brand new home. Now, what's interesting here is you can make your home as big as you want. Let's say you're going to have another child while you just dig out a new room. The only thing you have to be careful about is you need to know the boundaries so you don't break through into your neighbor's home. The churches we visited were absolutely fascinating. Are you going to go, Jerry? Okay. You're absolutely, this is the Greek Orthodox. And it was built in beautifully colored rock. And I think the sculptured ceiling is what made this one so special. Now, if you notice, there's no chairs here at all. And apparently they stand during the service. The Anglican one was a little bit smaller, but certainly very, very impressive as well. You can see it was built in 1977. And inside, I know it's a little ways away, but you can see the cross here. The cross, the altar, and the podium were all made of local wood, and they, they were really quite, quite beautiful. Now, of course, there were other motels in town. Um, there were different ones, ones that you could stay at, and there was a couple of campgrounds. I'm not sure if there were one or two campgrounds, 
the caravanners that come through. Um, lots of Australians like to travel by, by camper. Our guides were very good. They showed us some really unique sites. There was water for purchase. You can see here 30 liters of water for 20 cents. This was right on Main Street. Beautiful artwork, um, top left, right hand corner. And the cemetery, the cemetery had this absolutely unique headstone. So it's about a man who designed his own casket of corrugated iron, which is the main building material in Australia. And his tombstone was an 18 gallon keg filled with beer. Written upon it, sit and drink on me. One of the colorful characters of this area. Um, even in town, there's even an artificial um, turf lawn bowling club. So it's, it's quite an active little place. The shops are dug into the hillside as well. Or they use air conditioning and unique signs to bring in the tourists. Now the golf course, Jerry and I are both golfers and the golf course was really unusual. There's no irrigation whatsoever. Um, we hear they have a very active Sunday league here. Bring your own piece of, of turf for teeing off. It's an 18 hole course and that's the clubhouse on the inset. We can't remember what they mixed with the sand to make the black greens. Ha ha ha. The reciprocal agreement came about through correspondence with St. Andrews, as in how many people from here are going to go to St. Andrews to golf? I think that is, and that is really quite funny. Just imagine the heat, the wind, the land, quite a challenge. Now, another source, it wasn't our guide, but he said that they played in the dark with glow balls to avoid the heat. And even our guide laughed at that. But it was quite interesting because you went across the road in places, and you know a golf ball but there was nobody out there at that time it was too hot so into the countryside we go on our flight in the man beside me used this quote to describe our destination they probably weren't his original words but i love it kubipedi may not be the end of the world but you can see it from here and that man was from an oil exploration company and he was coming for work the breakaways is an area that we went to visit and it was just a terrific vista of eroded lands, similar to our badlands, but I would say even more barren. I think this tree gets its photo taken a lot. It was the only tree in sight. The colors of the rock were really vivid. The two landforms in the middle are known as salt and pepper. And please notice that the writing there that Mad Max um, with Mel Gibson was filmed in this area as was, I haven't seen pitch black, but it apparently was filmed here as well. The famed dog fence, anybody who was interested in Australia, most of you have read about the, the dog fence. There was an incredible project that was trying to prevent the dingoes from entering sheep territory. Note that it runs 2,250 kilometers. Before any fencing at all, the dingoes just, just took their toll on the sheep. So individual farmers built fencing, and by the late 1800s, it merged into this extensive area. You can see it right to the end of the horizon. <coughs> Pardon me. And this is just another example, a very, very naked landscape. And it doesn't look like much, but it does work. Look at this. Talk about a true desert landscape. There was nothing there. Can you imagine wandering around out here when the temperature is, you know, 40 degrees or more? On a hill in Cooper Petty is this tourist attraction. Jerry, you go ahead. I'll be okay. Sorry, Jerry has to leave us, but I will just continue. So this, um, I'm just gonna, okay. Is this tourist attraction? It's a replica of the winches and the barrel. Pardon me, that the miners use in their claims. Now, note in the inset, it talks about in 1986, a cyclone made it this far inland and tore the winch handle right off. And that's the winch handle that is horizontal um, at the same height that I am there. And we learn, of course, a little more about, uh, about that when you see a winch like that. Beside the big winch is Cooper Petey's first tree. Here's the history. 
A miner constructed this tree to encourage his wife to stay. She had said to him, I will not live in a place where even a tree won't grow. Let's learn a little bit about opal mining. This gives you a very good idea of the process. You have to drill a vertical shaft, and then when you find a little bit of color, you go horizontally from there. Most opals are found between 50 and 75 feet, but some are as deep as 90 feet. Normally, a partnership would be one to two men. And some of them will work on their own. Now, if you look at the inset there, you can see the man there, and that's the top of the shaft, that little square above his head. And this is what natural opal looks like. The colors vary quite a bit. I know it's hard to tell in this picture because indoor lighting is tough. A fossilized opal is an incredible find, a very, very valuable find. This is better to show you the color. This is a wedge of opal. This was in one of the stores. We were all quite excited to do some noodling which means we're looking for our own opals and piles of rocks that are taken out of other mines. We do find bits and pieces and a couple of, of nice little pieces that um, we all got to, to bring home. Our group is quite small. It consisted of people from Ontario, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. We were constantly warned of the dangers and I, and I have to, even though the signs were well worn, I did love the sign, especially the one with the cameraman, because um, with Jerry and I both having a camera in our hand, I can imagine us doing something silly like that. Now, quite seriously, if anyone fell down the mine hole, it could be a very, very long time before they were found. A body would disappear very quickly. Now, not on the same line, but at one time, there were literally thousands of miners in this area, but there's only about 300 making their living here now. We asked why the holes weren't filled in. Now, one of them said other miners can then take the mine over and work on it. Um, another one said there's danger when it's refilled, it still wouldn't be stable enough and you wouldn't be able to, to mine it. And uh, I think to me that's the main reason is there's no way you could pack the ground like it originally was. Okay, and this. You can see here there's two million holes in this area. Now a miner can only work one claim at a time, and if he finds good color, he must give up the original claim and take out another one in that direction. You can't sell your own claim, it goes back to the mining commission and someone else will take it over. Okay. 50 meters by 50 meters, so quite a, quite a small claim. This is known as a blower, and it sucks up the debris from below ground. This mine is designed to show tourists, so, so the shafts are covered to make sure nobody falls in. But I love that all three men are looking down there and seeing what they can see. Every mine has to have escape routes, escape ladders. Keep that in mind with the story we just had with the mine in Ontario. Okay, and there's the winch and the crank for pulling the bucket up. Now, lucky for us, the mine that we visited had a tourist entrance. So they do make mines specifically for us to visit. We had to put on the hard hat and the pickaxe and we're ready to mine. It was a very good tour. We were only there an hour. I truly can't imagine spending an entire day underground, but it was fascinating. It's quite a maze, and we wonder how one does stay within the boundary of their own claim. Our guide, Ned, was very knowledgeable about the process, and he answered all of our questions. This gives you an idea of the pipe that has the blower attached to it and used to suck the debris out of the mine, so it's, it's a pretty big process. And this is an example of one of the drillers that's used to make the tunnels. 
Look at the, the dust, the powder. Back on the surface again, we saw a road tree. I was actually hoping to see lots more of these guys because they can actually have up to five or six trailers. And there's no traffic out here, so they really move. This one was heading to the market from the outback and it was full of camels. Well, after all our education, it's time to shop for opals. And we learned about doublets and triplets and so on. Now the price in the store in our hotel were a little steep. So we went down the street to where miners were selling their own treasures. And this is where I did buy one. If I hold it up, I hope the people, you might not be able to see it. I don't know. Oh, I think we'll just leave it. It's not huge. We will just leave that. Oops, sorry, wrong button. We also really enjoyed the wonderful Aboriginal artwork that we saw, and of course, the didgeridoos. Jerry can get a pretty good noise out of one, but I can't get a sound out of it. So uh, we did not bring one home, but we do have friends that um, it's a beautiful piece of artwork in their house. And at this place, this man kept um, orphan kangaroos. Now, as I mentioned, many, many kangaroos are injured um, and unfortunately killed by the vehicles that are traveling the highway. All the trucks have blue bars on the front. So they're brought in injured or abandoned and this couple keeps them as a tourist attraction. They seem pretty content. These guys just laying in the shade. And take a look at those feet. They're what's known as macropods. You can see the huge middle toe there. And you may ask, are they ever released? No, they're not. Um, because there's so many kangaroos out in the wild already. They're already known as a, as a nuisance. And so these guys are just kept. Now, I, I don't know how long they live in, in cap captivity, but certainly they do bring in the tourists here. Now, a mother rook it can be struck by a vehicle and the person climbs out to check it. The baby's still safe and alive in the pouch. They collect it, they bring it here. And then this would be the pouch that this man built to put the baby rooms in. Babies are as small as 200 grams at one month old and they have been rescued. So our, our baby son was 3,360 grams and here's a baby at 200 grams and it has lived. They are carried in a snuggly on the chest, just like we would carry a baby. And they don't all make it when they're that small, but most do. This little guy is three and a half months old and look at his little hand. Imagine getting up every three hours to feed this little guy. And the rest of the time, he basically just hangs around in that bag. They don't sleep through the night until they're seven months old. They're born naked and take quite a while to grow. So they have to build it first, sorry. So you have to be kept warm. So you can see this little guy doesn't have much fur on his arms. So Harry had a, a cloth bag in his pouch and plus two towels wrapped around him. And his two towels, his tail was still furless. Now the evening before we had met him in the store, and he just very gently blow in its face to get a kiss. And that's how they get to, they get to know each other. Absolutely adorable. Doesn't he look kind of bashful there? Look at those claws, they're still very long. Well, pretty soon it is time to head for our plane and back to Adelaide. It's 9.30 at night and it's still 38 degrees. This is an amazing town to visit just because of the unique way of life of living underground. But it was a great day to fly back south. You can see the sand plains, salt plains again, but nice to get back to where there's some actual green. And soon the city's below us and the next part of our down under adventure awaits. And I believe from there, we might've gone to Tasmania. I'm not sure. I hope you enjoyed that 
We enjoyed sharing it with you and um, hopefully we'll educate you and encourage you to head down under. Thank you. That's, that's great, Brenda. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, yes. As usual, your pictures are phenomenal. Thank you. And, and uh, I love your interest in all the, the wildlife. So Kangaroo Island is called that because, it, because of the kangaroos? No, I actually don't think I ever heard that. I'm trying to think if it went to the shape. I don't oh, think okay. it went to the shape. I think it just went to that because of the, of the populations of kangaroos on, you know, in the entire I think they just, I don't think there was a specific reason for so, not okay. that I remember. So, and uh, yeah. interesting that they introduced the koala and they did so well. They did really well. Now, so the numbers that I read recently were 50,000, but the fire, and many of you watching will have remembered the fires from 2020, and they destroyed over half of the koala population. So that's like 25,000 kangaroos that were destroyed in the fires because the fires actually covered, I think it was almost two thirds of the island at times. And if you look up Kangaroo Island Wildfire 2020, you'll see pictures of the devastation that was there. It was, it was amazing. And um, as I said, I, I apologize for not doing this ahead of time. There was a picture on on the internet, it was very similar to a picture I had that showed the before and after. But to me, it wasn't the trees, it was the animals. Like, I don't know what happened to the Nigerian bees. I don't know, you know, what happened to, because the kangaroo island kangaroos are kind of a different species. You know, you wonder how they did. And um, the koalas are probably the biggest concern because they have no illness. Whereas the koalas on mainland Australia do have an illness and they are losing some to that illness. But um, yeah, I, that fire was very, very devastating, especially after being there and seeing, you know, what it was, what it was yeah, like. Yeah, totally. So, and the pelicans, they were fascinating. Were, so were they really noisy? Oh, yes, 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 they can be very, and very, very aggressive because they were hungry. And as I said, sitting in the front row, was maybe not the best thing I could have done, but it was, I, like I honestly, I, I love pelicans and, and it was a great experience. And we did see some of them, you know, like just get very aggressive and snatch the fish out or smash the fish right out of another bird's bill. You know, they were, um, but absolutely fascinating. And, and that was, that was fun. They're, they're big birds, those guys. <laughs> I thought the pelican man was very brave. No. Oh, I <laughs> I did too. I don't think I could be faced it in the picture I have where they're all pointed towards them. I'm not sure I could sit there. With them. <laughs> <laughs> but we did love it. It was a very unique experience. And, and I know many of our pictures are taken at, um, you know, at wildlife preserves. Um, but that's partly because even though we would see them in the wild, you can't get the pictures or, you know, I, I can't share the information with you as much. So it, um, and, and I was very impressed with all the places we visited that the animals were very, very well taken care of as well. Well, you were very brave with the python too, I thought. Oh, I like snakes. <laughs> but I did not like how he started wrapping himself around me. I did get a little tense at that time. I <laughs> <laughs> and I'm surprised Jerry didn't bring back that little wallaby. Oh, yeah. Oh, I would love to. But actually, do you know what? There is a place in Kelowna now, and I'm sorry, I don't know the name of it, but if you look up Kangaroos Kelowna, because it just moved to Kelowna just the last year or so, you can go and feed a baby kangaroo. Oh, okay. and, uh, they, they, it's a wonderful, now, because it moved, um, I don't know what the facilities are like. I saw it when it was in Minfield, and they had a wonderful, wonderful collection of animals there. And as far as I know, they're the only ones kind of in our immediate area that you can have access to, I want to say kangaroos, because I think that's what was there when we were there. They may have been wallabies, but I'm not 100% sure. But certainly if you're in the um, Kelowna area, I would definitely check it out. It was a fascinating, fascinating place to visit. 
and wonderful for children, just wonderful for children. Mm -hmm. um, I had my niece's daughter feeding, you know, feeding a kangaroo a bottle, and she wasn't that far out of her own bottle. So, <laughs> so a good spot to check out. And the American kestrel. So was that introduced? It's called American because yeah. it's. I don't think it was introduced because kestrels do travel and migrate long, long, long miles. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the actual answer for you on that one. I would have to look it up, but we have seen kestrels in many areas of the world. So I would make the assumption that it is probably, now it may not be, it may have traveled there, but mm -hmm. um, you know, as I said, we've seen them in many, many parts of the world. So. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. So, and I, I always ask about souvenirs, and I believe you got a souvenir from Kangaroo Island. Oh, I have to show you this one. People laugh at me because I bring home unusual things. So this is a kangaroo, and people say, oh, how did you ever do that? But as I said, you have to remember there's more kangaroos on these islands than there should be. So this is a kangaroo paw back scratcher. And let me tell you, it is one effective back scratcher. So I, uh, I actually use it occasionally. <laughs> and from other parts of our ball home, I can always bring magnets. I have a little crocodile claw magnet for another part of us. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so, yeah, and I did, I did get my little, I'll try holding it up now in case I don't know. Where's if I try, I don't think you can see it well enough to get the color. Oh, you can, yes, it's lovely. It's all writing when it comes to opals. Mm -hmm. but, um, and I did get a couple of other opals, but um, unfortunately one of them was stolen, so I don't have it anymore. So, yet, um, But that was fun, fun shopping anyway. <laughs> so it really was a weird place. I've heard about it before, but you kind of wonder how they knew opals were there. Like the, the yeah. Aborigines maybe found them or... That's very possible, I would think that, um, but you have to remember there's lots of oil and gas exploration that goes on all over Australia as well. And um, it's even possible that somebody found them, you know, through that. But um, to think that that's one of the main areas where, where opals are, you know, sent all over the world. Um, and there were some absolutely exquisite samples of them in the stores too. Like I'm talking, you know, folders of opal that were, you know, that were this big, like there were some, you know, the raw opals that had not been turned into jewelry or anything. And, um, but I don't know if it's the demand for opal hair has decreased or it's just people aren't quite as living, um, likely to live in a spot like Cooper PD to, to make a living. Okay. So you mentioned that some of them were fossilized. Yes. Which, that means put under pressure or? Yes. And to me, it would be like, because an opal is quite a soft stone. So my guess, it would be sort of like, and this is a bad example, but like from coal to a diamond, you know, that, that it became a harder, um, more solid, more solid piece. But, but the one that, that showed there, um, I don't know if you can still work on it, you know, like an actual opal and shape it. And use it for jewelry or oh, not because it's too hard okay it might be I, I honestly don't know whether it's so valuable that they don't do that but the museums and the stores and so when you go into a store it wasn't just going to look at the jewelry you talk to the guy who's there because he could very well be the miner mm -hmm. you know you, you would talk about you would talk about some of his you know stories of being underground and and uh just maybe again how isolated it was and, and how lonely of work it was and, and uh, but their their displays and the artwork the artwork too was exquisite it really was so and then we were only there you know you fly in one day you spend two days you fly out the fourth day so you don't have to have a lot of time to to include Make it, it worthwhile yeah. in, your, in your journey. And that's what we ended up doing this time is little things, you know, here and there that um, kind of completed what we felt was our, our excursion to. So the, the, the um, where they've dug the rock out, it doesn't look very hard. Like, are there cave-ins quite a bit or 
because the pile of dirt outside each hole just it just looks like dirt like it doesn't really look like rock it does but if you look at that if you remember the picture of the driller okay the way it drills through so it would pulverize it oh, okay before it sucked it up yeah so so it could be so it would almost come out well as you say very very quite finely now they didn't talk about cave-ins but I, I mean i'm sure there were some and probably that's another topic that would be interesting to research but that's also why they said they always had to have um, an exit hole of some sort. Mm -hmm. So it sounded like it would be a little similar to, to the Ontario one where you had to have an, an entrance and an exit of some sort. But I mean, can you imagine even one misstep when you're walking around countryside like that? And there are people that have literally disappeared, like they have no idea where they ended up. Um, I'm not saying that's a common thing, but but there's, certain there's so many holes. So the, 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 the pictures you took from the air, it just kind of looks like a bunch of little ant hills, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> and they're everywhere, right? Well, these are when you get down to, to ground level and you realize like some of those piles could be, you know, six, seven, eight feet tall. Um, it, was, it was quite something to, to see how much debris had been taken out. And don't you sometimes think in, in a in a spot like that, if they keep digging at some point, the whole thing's just going to cave in because there's too many holes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it was it was a very very unique unique place, and and uh, you know, as I say, just just to just to be in a bedroom underground. I know it sounds silly because I mean, you could sleep in a cave or you could you know, but it was an actual hotel room with a TV and everything. No no yeah. windows. It, uh, I'd love to have gone in some of the local homes. I yes. think maybe I should suggest that. Well, the churches showed it fairly well, mm -hmm. but maybe I can get them to add that to a trip. I don't know if we'll yes. ever go back, but it would be, it would be nice to see one of the homes. But, uh, well, we really appreciate you sharing that with us, both both of them. It's nice to get, dig a little deeper into places and find out a bit more about specific spots like that. So. Thank you very much again. You're, you always are great at taking us someplace we wouldn't have thought of going. It's great. Yeah. Well, it was definitely our pleasure. And if we get to travel again, now we've still got lots of places you haven't seen yet. Yes, I know. I've got you on my list. <laughs> I'll let you know, too, what's, what's up next. So get to but thank you, Priscilla. And, and again, we, we love sharing. And, and we hope that we hope everybody did enjoy it. Yes. So, well, that's pleasure. wonderful. So I'm just going to mention two plugs here for the library. I, so um, this is the October uh, program guide. We're doing it by the month right now because there's so much going on. So if you happen to be in the library or looking on the website, you'll see lots of, of interesting things. Even though our programming has all gone virtual, you can still come into the library. We still have express service, all three branches. And another program we're doing for the fall is this Four Seasons of Wellness Hiking Fall Challenge with Red Deer Wellness Alliance until um, November 30th. So you can pick up one of these or print it off the website. And if you fill in all these different activities, you can submit your form and there's all different prizes that you can get entered in. So keep everybody out and about. So far, the weather's been quite good. I don't know what the rest of the fall will be like, but I want to keep you all busy. And we'll see you in November, hopefully, the first Wednesday. And thank you very much again, Brenda. And thanks to Jerry, too. It is our pleasure, definitely. So thank you, Priscilla. I appreciate it.